Um, John 1, verse 14. John what? John 1. It's almost to the end. There shouldn't be about that much left over. The Gospel of John. John. The Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verse 14. <laughs> Which of you could divide your Bible in half and then take the back half and divide it in half again? Can you just tell us what page it is? 731, uh, 39 okay. in the Black Bible. Okay. <laughs> and we have more people coming. Yay. You can see everything from up here, by the way. <laughs> the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came to the Father full of grace and truth. start with the Gospel of John and just read through it. Maybe read through it two, three, four, one million times, ever how many times it takes here, but just to begin to understand a little bit about who this person Jesus is. And I've always found it interesting how the different writers of the Gospel kind of started their, what's essentially a biography here. And we see Matthew and Luke started Pretty reasonably for most of us, they started with Jesus' birth. Mark starts his with the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry here. John starts off his gospel. He likes to change things up a little bit. He goes all the way back to Genesis 1-1 and brings us all the way up to that current time here. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, and if that sounds familiar to you, that's because that's what Genesis 1 starts off with in the beginning and he starts off and he begins to lay that Jesus didn't suddenly appear here on this earth they didn't were just up in heaven sitting around with nothing to do one afternoon having to look down and oh my gosh there's a sin problem in the world here that we need to address suddenly right now that Jesus was there from the very beginning it says in fact that he was with God and he was God and that through him, this entire existence that we know here as our earth, as our world, came into being. He then goes on and he gives some other little clues in the beginning part of John 1 here. That this was not the first time that Jesus has actually appeared. And it's these verses that I use as kind of our stepping off point for a little teaching that I do at the center called Jesus in the Old Testament. And we've looked at a number of the stories when I've been up here before. And we've seen that Jesus was actually all throughout the Old Testament. He was the man that Abraham was talking to about Sodom and Gomorrah before those cities were destroyed. He was the face that Moses talked to. It says as a friend talks to a friend here face to face. He was the warrior that Joshua met on the way to Jericho. When the warrior told him, take off your sandals, for the ground around me is holy. He was the king seated, seated high and on the throne in the temple whenever Isaiah came in one day. And he was the fourth man who was in a fiery furnace with three of Daniel's friends that we've read about. So he's been throughout the whole Old Testament. And John brings us all the way through. And he deposits us in what is one of my all-time most favorite verses here. And I see a few grins out there because you, if you know me a little bit, you know that I have any number of favorite verses in the Bible. I have an equal number of most favorite verses. But I only have ten, and I try to keep it capped at ten here, of all-time most favorite verses here. <laughs> And the reason that John 1.14 is there is because this describes a Jesus encounter not like any that's occurred before in the Old Testament. 
And let's go ahead and have a word of prayer real quick here. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this day. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the, the inspiration, the strength that we can draw out of it. And Lord, as we're opening your word right now, I just pray for your presence here in a mighty way. That, Lord, as we read these words, that your spirit would fan them into life in our hearts. And that, Lord, we would take them from here and put them to use in this coming week. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Those stories that I described that I've gone into a lot more detail up here in different teachings and stuff that I've done were short, momentary appearances of Jesus in a human form to a certain person or maybe even a small group of people throughout the Old Testament. John starts off, and the reason I love John 1.14 is the first four words in there. It says, the Word became flesh. Think about this. He goes back and he starts in John 1.1, 1, 1, and he says, the Word was with God, and in fact, the Word was God. And in John 1.14, he's now saying that God became flesh. He didn't just appear in a fleshly form that we would understand as a human being, but he actually became wholeheartedly 100% man. He goes on to describe this existence here. It wasn't a set apart. He didn't suddenly show up here fully grown and live in a bubble for a couple of days so that everybody got a chance to see him and then go to the cross. It says, no, he made his dwelling among us. That phrase kind of loses a little bit in translation as we look at it here today. The, the exact words were he pitched his tent among us. And that gives you the, the, the thought here that Jesus not only appeared here on this earth in a fleshly form, he didn't take on this flesh for just mere minutes here, but he actually lived long enough to ingrain himself into our fabric of our society. He actually became one of the crew here. If you've ever gone on a camping trip, the box proclaims that the tent is easy and quick to set up. Think of tents in this time here. This was all day and several days worth of work to get this thing set up. It describes that he's going to be here for a while with us. And that's what John is trying to get across here, is that not only did the Word, did God become flesh, but that he also made his dwelling here among us. John 1.14 has two of the top three reasons that I believe everyone should have Jesus as their higher power. They're in no particular order here, but the first reason that we're going to look at is God became flesh. If you're stretching, if you're looking for a higher power, and you're considering any number of options, use this as one of your litmus tests here. Did your God become flesh? Or was your God trying, or was your flesh be trying, trying to become God? Mm. There's a huge, vast world of difference here. And he says in here that he made his dwelling here among us. And what kind of dwelling was it? Flip just one book to the left. Go to Luke chapter 2. I want to read a story that I think just highlights. Just how far Jesus was willing to make his dwelling here among us. Luke chapter 2. It's a story we've probably read several times, and maybe you've never noticed it in this particular light. Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 22. It says, When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Mary and Joseph took him, him being Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what it is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Like I said, we probably read through these at Christmas time any number of times, maybe as we were reading through the Bible, and it was just always, okay, that's cute. Mary and Joseph, devout Jews, of course, they were going to be keeping the law. Let's go ahead and get on into the cool, juicy parts here of Jesus' life. I want you to think, though, for just a second about this scenario. Mary and Joseph, Jesus has been born. They've 
completed their purification time, and they're coming in to present him to God as the firstborn of this union here. And they bring with them, it says, the sacrifices that were required, two pigeons or two doves. I'm going to read to you the actual law as it's found in Leviticus chapter 12. You got Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus, third book in the Bible, Leviticus chapter 12. I You know, I should give you one of these. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 12. Yeah. Leviticus 12, I'm going to start reading in verse 7 here, the actual law. It says, He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for a woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. If she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she'll be clean. <clears throat> if you flip back over to Luke chapter 2, you see the offering Mary and Joseph presented as their sacrifice and their burnt offering was two doves, two young pigeons. They gave the poor man's gift instead of the lamb. And it wasn't like, you know, Jesus' birth surprised them in any way. They had this angelic ultrasound that went on about nine months before this that told them exactly what it was going to be. It was going to be a boy. And when he was going to be born. And that whole nine months, they couldn't get enough money together for a lamb. They had to bring the two doves in there and give them to him. And that's how far Jesus went into his dwelling here among men. Was when I find myself in want and need, which I do on a regular occasion here, I can go back to stories like this and understand that my Savior, my higher power, understands want and need. He grew up in a family that was not like the Kardashians of today. He didn't have a special set of hard life. He actually lived a very meager kind of working man existence here. And so he understands, and he understands fully what it's like to be in the inside of this fleshly body. John 1.14 says that the Word became flesh. It's one of those mysteries that I would never understand, and I blame my college time for it because I took statistics in college. And God is, or Jesus is at once 100% God, 100% this Word of God, and 100% flesh, 100% man. If you've ever taken statistics, maybe in college or looked at them here, you can't have 200% of anything. Jesus somehow pulls this off, though. He's 100% God, He's 100% man. And He fully understands what it's like to live as 100% man out there. The tail end of John 1.14 has the second thing that I think makes Jesus superior to any other higher power that you could possibly dream up here. And that is, he, it says he was full of grace and full of truth. Again, we have another dichotomy here. We have 100% grace and 100% truth. I need that in a higher power. I need to know that there's a standard that I have to strive and I have to work in order to attain. That it's not going to be handed to me, it's not going to be given to me. It's something that I'm going to have to work on every single day of the rest of my life in order to just get that much closer to it. But I'm never going to be able to get to it. Because one thing, if you come to the center and you want to sit in on one of the classes, come Monday morning, 9 o'clock. Because whatever the flavor of the week is, and we look at God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Bible, but we always start off Monday with truth in regard to either God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or the Bible. 
And you will learn very quickly if you get nothing else out of coming to the hour long that we spend taking a look at that, is that the truth in accordance with God is absolute. There was never a time that Jesus misrepresented himself, told a white lie. Any, it was absolute, 100% verifiable truth in everything he did. And that's the standard that he has now set for me. As I go through my life, I find myself on a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute -minute basis falling short of that truth. And that's where I need that 100% grace to come in and to pick me back up and set me back, not lower the standard to where I am. God has absolutely no child left behind, has nothing to do with God whatsoever here, okay? The standard will always be the standard, and you will never meet the standard. That's why we need the 100% grace. And if you're looking for a higher power, here's your second litmus test. Do they hold you to the standard, and do they have grace when you don't meet it? I love this dichotomy here. Truth on one hand, grace on the other. How does that 100% inhabit the same being here? There are several examples that we could take a look at. We've looked a number of times at John chapter 5. It's the healing of the man by the pool. And so I didn't want to use it again today, although it's a wonderful representation of Jesus being all grace and all truth at the same time. Instead, I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 8. And we're going to take a look at another story that doesn't get quite as much play, quite as much time and attention up here, but it is a wonderful story. While you're turning over to John chapter 8, Let me go ahead and set the story. It's early in the morning. It's just about dawn, it says. The weather's still cool. The sun hadn't come out and started baking everything. The city's not really hustling, bustling. Everybody's kind of quietly getting up and getting on, getting going about their day here. And so it's a perfect time to go to the temple. You can really have some, some personal, silent time along with God. And so there's a number that have come to the temple this early in the morning, Jesus being one of them. And when they see Jesus walk into the temple, they are immediately attracted to him, and he begins to do a teaching with the folks that are gathered there. He hasn't called this meeting. It just kind of naturally happened. And he's sitting there, and he's going through te this teaching time. And if I know anything about disruptions in class, and he is just about to make his most impactful point when all of a sudden this group of men and this one screaming, yelling, crying, sobbing woman suddenly come into the temple. Immediately at this point, all listening is done, all learning is done, all teaching is done. We now have to address this issue that suddenly come in here. This group of men drag this woman right here and they, it says they throw her right in front of Jesus. And they're so arrogant. That they don't even knock. They don't ask, hey, Jesus, is this okay? Is this a good time? Should we wait till one of the breaks? Or No, they just barge right in. What does the Son of God have to say to us that's so important that it can't wait until I get my needs or this particular scenario addressed here? Just the arrogance in their thought process as they drop this woman in front of them. John 8. And we'll start in verse 3. It says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone a woman, such a woman. What now do you say? They made her stand before the group. Can you imagine a more humiliating experience than to be caught in the act of adultery? Now, if you ever see Jesus, uh, any of the little miniseries, they will have this scene in there at some point. It seems like all the major ones have, have chosen to include this scene in there. Every single one of them, the woman is fully clothed, maybe a little mussed up, looks like from being drunk halfway across the city here. She was caught in the act of adultery. 
I don't think she had a stitch of clothes on. If she was wearing something, it was something definitely you wouldn't be seen dead in church in, okay? And they made her stand in front of everybody. Humiliating her. Wanting her to, and wanting themselves to look that much better. Look how much holier I am. I was able to get dressed this morning. This woman here was caught, it says, in the act of adultery. They said, teacher, we're on our way out of town. We're going to stone this woman, just like Moses said. We just wanted to stop here real quick to see what you thought of the whole thing, just to see if you had anything you wanted to say. It says they were trying to trap him. They thought they were going to work God into this corner that he couldn't get out of. And so they're, they, they've got him now where they think he's trapped. Doesn't say anything about Jesus running around like a chicken with his head cut off, wondering what is he going to do? How is he going to get out of this? No, it says Jesus just simply stooped down and he started writing in the dirt. I would love for somebody to have written down what was it he was writing there, but they didn't. A number of folks who study the Bible a lot and are really smart believe that Jesus may have been writing down some names and some dates that wouldn't have made much sense to anyone else, but when somebody specific looked at that, it caused a little condemnation in their own heart as they began to see that maybe somebody else knew about this one particular little incident that they thought was all covered up here. Jesus then stands up and he says, hey, I've got this great idea. Whoever is without sin, just let him go ahead and cast the first stone. It says then Jesus goes back down and he keeps writing in the sand here. As he's doing so, this group of men who were so arrogant that they couldn't even let the Son of God finish his sentence suddenly begin to look on the ground and they begin to see a familiar name and a familiar date or a familiar phrase or something in there that causes them to know that he knows what's been going on. And it says that from the oldest to the youngest, they just begin to back away because they don't want what's written on that ground to be talked about in church here because they've got a reputation to uphold. And so they back away. And it says they leave here. The woman's still naked. She's still laying there in front of everybody. She's got to be sobbing. She's got to be humiliated. She's got to be condemning herself here. The guilt's just got to be incredible on this woman right now because this is the temple in Jerusalem. It's not like she could go to another church somewhere else. This was where everybody came. People knew her and may have always suspected that she was this kind of lady, but now we have proof positive of what exactly she is. The guilt, the shame, it's just got to be all over her. Verse 10 in John chapter 8 says, Jesus straightened up. This is after everybody has left. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11 says, No one, sir. That phrase needs a little bit of explanation. What she, what she really said was, Present company excluded. No one else is here. Okay, there's me and there's you, and I'm condemning myself right now horribly. And I would imagine you as a teacher in the law have something to say to me, but everyone else has left. It's now just me and you, Son of God. Jesus looks at her, and the eyes have got to be just radiating 100% grace. Because his very next word says, neither do I. If there's a one and two equation here, you take me out. I'm not condemning you either. The relief that's got to wash over her. Knowing that this is, this is not, she's not going to be held. She's not going to be punished for this, for her past indiscretions here. It's got to be incredible. Jesus then looks at her, and he's got to have these eyes of just pure truth radiating out of them. He answers her. He says, neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now. Leave your life of sin. If we had looked at John 5, we would have found the paralytic. Jesus found him and said, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. 
I don't know what would be worse than being caught naked in the middle of church. I don't want to know. Okay. This is Jesus telling her, you've got a chance now. You've been forgiven from this past, but it's got to stop. And it stops right here, right now. This is truth in your life, is that you've got to stop what you're doing in order to fully embrace the grace side of me. I told you there was two, two reasons why I believe Jesus is the hands down favorite for higher power of the millennium here, okay? The first one is that he is 100% God, he's 100% man. He understands what it's like to live as a man, he understands what it's like to be tempted, it says later on in Romans there. The very next part of it is, oh, and he didn't sin the whole time that he was being tempted. I know what it's like to be tempted. I can't quite get that second part down there. But Jesus understands it. It says he's a much more effective high priest for us because he understands what temptations feel like. He also is full of 100% grace and 100% truth. He holds me to the most high standard that's out there, but he has the grace to understand that I'm going to constantly miss that mark. I told you John's my favorite book. I love reading John. It's got a number of my most favorite, those top ten that I was telling you about earlier. I want to share with you my hands down number one most favorite verse in the entire Bible and it's found in John chapter 10. <clears throat> We've looked at Jesus understands what it's like to be human. He also understands what it's like to be God. He understands what it is to uphold the truth. He understands what it is to have grace and give that grace to us in our life when we fall short. Although our heart is to do the right thing. John chapter 10. Jesus is teaching here. And he lays it out on the line here. And he gives basically two sides to a coin. And I understand and I love this verse because I have lived both sides of the coin here. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus is talking about Satan here. He doesn't even dignify him by giving him a name. He just gives him his title. He's a thief. And it says that the only reason he's here is to steal, to kill, and to destroy I told you I'd live both sides of those life, and most of you know my background, and so we don't need to go into it here. Just suffice it to say, if you haven't heard it, steal, kill, and destroy pretty much summed up a large part of my existence here, okay? And if we only had the one side of the coin, it would be a hopeless, miserable existence. But there's a second side coming up. I have come. This is Jesus saying, me, I. Right here, I came so that they may have life and have it to the full. It would have been enough for Jesus to have forgiven my sins. It would have been enough for Jesus to have told this woman, I don't condemn you. But he didn't stop there. He sends her on the way with a mission now. Go live, leave this life of sin here. John 10.10, 10, the life I live today is so much fuller than I would have ever have imagined. The relationships that I have with family and friends are so much richer now than I would have imagined six plus years ago. The ministry that we have here at Step 7, if we think back to six years ago, it was very small, and we couldn't have imagined the things that we are doing today to be able to reach the addicted for Jesus here. Abundant life. A life to the full. That's what Jesus desires for us. It's all captured in one word. It's a little four little words. starts with L and it's love. Not only is Jesus 100% God, 100% man. Not only is he full of grace as well as full of truth. He loves me. He doesn't tolerate me. He doesn't put up with me. He loves me. Enough that he forgives my sins and wants to give me this abundant life. 
I like how Jesus chose here to say, they will have this life. Not we, not those that were necessarily right around him. That would have been that Old Testament, I'm here for a bit, and when I'm done, we'll continue on with our life in the way that it's always lived here. No, he says it's, it's a they. This is from right now, from when I have spoke these words till I come again, I am now heir to that they, okay? We should, in fact, have a they pride parade or something like that, that we could just walk around and say, you know what, I'm a they. I have this abundant life. My higher power loves me. That's the third litmus test if you're looking for a higher power. It's number 